not having the community, not having the, the village physically close by. So I really, I do feel like I have a ton of supportive people, but I just constantly find myself thinking about my request inconveniencing them. It just would be nice, like if someone honestly like lived across the street, like literally, you know, um, I just wish I had more people closer that I can call upon and yeah, like help me out, feed us, swap house chores. I'll clean your house if you cook for me. You know, I want, I want to be able to do that with some folks nearby and it just seems too difficult. Today's guest is Erica St. Louis, a mom to a young son who is passionate about bringing the tribe mentality back to motherhood. Erica felt a lack of community herself as she ventured through her first year of motherhood, and that inspired her to re-examine the way we interact with one another as parents. I love the timing of this episode because last week I chatted with Olivia Howell, who spoke about finding her mom tribe as well. Olivia was able to fill that gap by having a robust online community of mothers she can turn to, while Erica talks today about the physical presence she feels is also needed. We also chat about how motherhood is a long process of letting go, and how letting go of the things you felt were once so important can actually give you a sense of freedom as you grow into motherhood. Welcome to the This Is Parenting Podcast, a show devoted to sharing the roller coaster journey of parenthood from moms and dads all over the world. I'm your host, Andrea Rhodes. Information and show notes about today's episode can be found at thisisparentingpodcast.com. Let's get started. Hey, Erica, thank you so much for joining me today. Erica, why don't you share with my audience a little bit about who you are, your family, what you're up to these days, and then we'll kind of jump in. Awesome. Yes. Well, thank you, Andrea, so much for having me on your show. I was like so honored when you asked me to be a part of your your podcast. And um, a little bit about me. My name is Erica St. Louis. I am a new mom. I'm a podcaster, new podcaster of a podcast called The M Word with Erica. And it's about the same type of stuff like mothering, you know, sharing truths from the, the mothering journey. And I also want to share traditions of, from other moms around the world. I've, I've traveled a lot. I used to travel a lot with the work that I did. I used to work for a humanitarian organization, and I was just blown away of, about how the women there are so so different but so similar to women here in North America. And so their stories and, and their experiences and, and their faces, honestly, have really stayed with me. And as I became a new mom, I thought I found myself thinking about those women and, you know, how maybe some of our experiences have been similar as they became new moms. So um, that's sort of like where the idea for the podcast came from. And like by trade, I'm a digital communicator, digital marketer, do all the, you know, communication things, but also um, a lot of digital strategy work. So that's, that's what I do as a creative freelancer. I, after having my son, I like quit my job a few months after having him and needed a break and, and now I'm doing the freelancing and the podcasting, and it's, it's been an amazing experience. So I know some of the content from your Instagram that I have been really drawn to. You seem to be very big on um, finding your mom tribe again, and, and it sounds like you feel as a community as a whole that we've really lost a sense of tribe as mothers. And is that from the traveling that you just mentioned and, and what you've learned from all of those journeys or where does that come from? Well, the first place where it really comes from is me feeling like I need more women around me. You know, when I look up and I see who's around me and who I interact with on a daily basis, it's pretty quiet, you know, aside from the strangers that I see every day. And I live in a pretty busy metropolitan area. Um, I live in Maryland, which is basically, I live in a suburb of Washington, D.C. So it's a really busy area, but, you know, everyone lives, you know, 40, 30 minutes away, you know, people are busy, all of that. And so I had been reflecting on just my need for more support. And then it got me thinking about my childhood, even though, you know, my mom might say, women her, of her generation had it a lot easier, they had more women around them, you know, to support them. So in some ways, we have it easier because we have more technology. But in a lot of ways, we are at a disadvantage because we don't have other women. So I started thinking about that. And then I started talking to other women 
then who had the same experience and who was feeling the same stuff. And then it brought me back to think about the women in these villages. You know, when we talk about it takes a village. And I think sometimes the image that we have in our mind is of a woman in a village in Cambodia or a woman in a village in Nepal. But there were villages here in America too, you know, in North America. And over time that village changed and it looked different. And I I want us to have that village back. I think it's more than a want. I think we desperately need that village uh, mindset back. And how do you propose that we kind of get back to a village type of mentality? I, Cause I'm a hundred percent with you that especially that first year, it's just intense yeah. and that's when yeah. we need to lean on people but have those resources available to us and then feel it's okay to, to use them. So how would you propose mm-hmm. we kind of get back to that? I've been thinking a lot about that question because I, it's so difficult and, and we've changed so much that it's hard to imagine that version. I think that the version that we're going to have to put together is a new version. And one of the first things that I see is that we need to spend more time face to face, quite honestly. I mean, like the village was a actual village. It was a, you know, a place that you can, that you actually, you know, felt and was physically part of. And I think that we don't spend enough face-to-face time together. We have meetups, we have conferences, we have different events, and we gather around these planned and coordinated, highly coordinated things. Many times we have to pay money for, but you know, when you think about the people that we keep in touch with, they may not live in the same city as us. So we might have these deep relationships, but one person lives in LA, one person lives in New York, or one person lives 40 minutes away. So I think that we have to really start spending more time together. And if our closest of closest pals are not in our city, at least find some women who you can at least connect on that mother level with. So you feel comfortable talking about your, your milk that's leaking like crazy, or you feel comfortable talking about um, how you're really sucking at grocery shopping these days. Like we need to have these conversations face to face and with women that we at least feel that we can share that stuff with. And I, and one of the things that I've discovered after becoming a mom is, how comfortable I am sharing my, my struggles and my joys and my weird things with another mom that I don't really know well. You know, it's very, I find it very easy. It's much easier to do that than to start talking to, when I was single, you know, talking to a woman that, you know, I didn't know. And so you feel that instant connection just because you're kind of in the same, uh, yes. same war, so to speak. With same this. war. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I do, especially when I see a mom that, has children around the same age as my child it's like you give that look or I I give that look to her like hey are we going through the same thing right now (laughs) you know and like sometimes I get the look back you know in the mall at like Starbucks like I've gotten the look back and I don't know but you Andrea have have you experienced that at all (laughs) Yeah, I think for me, it's more of the times when I don't have kids with me and then I see a mom struggling with something that I've either gone through already or am currently going through and I give her that knowing look or offer some support in some way. And yeah, yes, Yes. that's happened. And so like we can't fabricate that over social media. Like we can't create that over social media that just doesn't exist or over text or over even the phone. Like Although I think the phone is like the, maybe that's the step one, but let's talk on the phone more. And then after we talk on the phone, then we'll maybe move closer to like meeting in person. But I think that the first thing is definitely connecting face to face. But I also think another big step is uh, us doing the internal work on the individual level and thinking about, do I ask for enough help? Am I, am I truly vulnerable enough with the women around me who I call friends? Do I ever ask them for help? And do I ever offer them help? And I think the the more of us that start practicing this, asking for help and offering help randomly, I think the more, you know, the, 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 this community feeling will start to come back because we'll be spending time in each other's homes and we'll be spending time having these honest conversations about our needs. So that it almost becomes a behavior change that will get passed down and it becomes like a tradition at that point. Exactly, exactly. Because I think that that's what the behavioral pattern was before all of the technology that we have and not just tech, but the, 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 the focus on career. I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm also still kind of doing my own research as to like, 
when did this change happen? Like, I'm actually mm-hmm. interested in talking to some sociologists about that. Maybe there's, you know, people studying this issue, but there was a time when things started changing, when people weren't, weren't as, weren't coming up around, you know, their community that they were familiar with, or they didn't have a community. I think it's also started happening when people moved away for careers. Yeah. You know, I moved away for a career. My home base is in Canada, Montreal, Canada, that is where I'm originally from. And I moved from there to Ottawa, then I moved from there to Toronto, and then from, from ter- Toronto to Maryland. And I've been here for nine years now, all for a job, you know, mm. all for career and or, or education, you know, to, that would lead to a career. And while I've had great experiences, now that I'm a mom, it's like, man, I would do anything to have those women I grew up with around me. I would do anything. I would move in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's it, this conversation is really interesting, and I do wonder if we. I, I I'm, I'm going to mention. Did you, did you ever have, or have you ever participated in like a meal train for a new mom? No, I've never, but I've heard of them. So those, I'm I'm in the Midwest, and I think they're probably pretty popular here because we're super food driven in the Midwest. Nice, yeah, um, I love it. <laughs> um, very hearty home cooked meals here, but yes. but meal trains are fairly popular where somebody takes initiative and sets up like an online spreadsheet, and there's there's online um, websites that do this for you, and you can oh, wow. sign up for a time slot to bring over a warm meal to the new mom, um, or really anybody that's in a situation that needs a meal. I always wonder if that's like a really nice first step in this because what happens is you bring over the meal and then you feel a little at least in my experience I feel like weird do I like drop it and go or do I baby while they eat I mean I think those are all options but it's it's just such not it's not really a normal behavior that I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing in this socially awkward yet very appropriate situation that I find myself in. whoa that's honest that is really honest. I've never heard that. I mean, like people have told me about meal trains and they've participated in them and we've had them at work, but I've never heard anybody talk about, okay, so as a meal donor, this is how I felt. Why was I feeling so awkward? You know, I don't know what to do, but imagine like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, do you think a woman would have felt that way? No, no. And I, yeah, I don't, not, I don't right? think it would have had to have been organized either. You know, like they would have, right. known to have gone no, over. Right. Right. Where did we go wrong? I think, I think it has to change. I really, I mean, it may be, you know, this may be an unpopular message, but I really think it has to change. There are too many women struggling out here. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's really rough. A couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine who moved to the area about a year ago, she, she had her baby about three months ago, her second baby three months ago, moved her from California with her husband. Long story short, like she decided to go back to work. She just got a new job and was scheduled to start, you know, I, I think about a week after she got the job and she had no child care for her baby, her mm-hmm. two month ba- two month old baby turning three months. And she was asking where my son goes and I was sharing and I was sharing her links and stuff. And then something said to me, Erica, like you need to offer to watch this child if she really can't find someone. The likelihood of her finding someone is very low, like within the next week, because it's just so competitive and, the, you know, there just are no spots for infants out here. And, and yeah. she had no idea. So anyways, I offered to watch the baby for that first week. And she was like, um, I'm going to have to take you up on that. And that's when it hit me like, whoa wow, this is a really bad situation. Like so many women are in this situation, you know, like thankfully I was able to have the type of schedule where I I was able to do that. But, you know, if I, if if I didn't do that, like she really would have been in a huge jam. Yeah. Uh, Maybe, you know, had to not take the job anymore. And I I don't think enough women are talking about this because we are self-sufficient. You know, this, this culture is a culture of self-sufficiency and, you know, we got together and any, if you show any sign of weakness, like you can't do it, that is a disgrace. Like that is not cool, Mm -hmm. you know, and we're keeping up this image that many of us like really don't subscribe to, but we're, we're maintaining the status quo and the status quo is is killing us. Yeah. Sinking us into depression and all of these things. Oh, I could go on about the depression side of it. (laughs) (laughs) Let's switch gears a little. What would you say for, at a personal level is the best thing about parenting right now? Oh, that's a great question. 
the best thing about parenting is it feels that like a bunch of people my age are parents also. Mm -hmm. So it, I feel like I'm part of a club, honestly. And, you know, we're experiencing all of the same things, whether we are, you know, something as simple and funny as we're all singing Baby Shark and we're all annoyed with that, or we're all watching Blippi and we're like, oh my God, or we have opinions about their cartoons. Like, that's fun. And then um, I also think it's cool that we're able to share some of these like more serious subjects, like the lack of village or the depression or whatever. You know, I think it's millennials are a fun parenting group and it's, I, I feel really proud to be part of it, honestly. Yeah, and I don't know, perhaps it's all anecdotal, but I do feel like as a, as a group, we seem to be a very, a very thoughtful group of parents, which I really yes. am happy to kind of see that in general. I feel like we are putting a lot of thought behind the decisions that we're making and we're yes. about the future and how this, the decisions we make today will impact our kids' life. So right. I, I'm definitely proud to be a part of that, especially since we got shit on so much when we were, you know, yes. 10 years ago, millennials, we were, we were the worst. So I feel like we really took that criticism and, and used it as fuel. And, and now we're turning out to be pretty amazing parents from what I can tell. I think so too. I think so too. I, I could agree with that. I think we're doing really well. And I'm really glad you said that because that was a really good reminder. I think sometimes like, because we hear all that negative press about us, sometimes yeah. it makes us, me at least wonder like, oh my gosh, am I one of those crazy millennials? But that, that was a good reminder. Yeah. You know, I think they're, the media is starting to move on to the next generation. So that's kind of nice. I think so. Yeah, it is <laughs> we're, nice. We're old, we're old and boring now. We're old. Uh, yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to be in that category. Same here. Because you're very tuned into this. What do you wish there was less of in parenting culture? Oh, such a good question. Um, less books. Less less push for like oh. book knowledge. Let's talk yes, about it's that. Too much. Yeah, I think it's too much. I mean, it's I'm, I'm on this village thing, so everything I say goes back to the village. But you know, I have been feeling like. Oh gosh, everything. I have one friend in particular. I'll, I'll use this example better. Like. So this one friend in particular, every stage, like our babies are two months apart. And mm -hmm. I feel at every stage, like she's always proposing some book, right? Oh, and, okay. you know, on one hand, it's like, okay, this is cool. All right. I'm sure the information is interesting. But as I've browsed through different books, all the books have all kinds of advice, conflicting opinions. One person has this perspective. The next person has that perspective. And like, while it's all useful and interesting, it is just too much. Women need to, that old school training that only older women can give us, the intuition. Women, I, I think as young moms, like we're also still building our intuition muscle, our, you know, the, the mother intuition muscle at least. And um, I think that older moms can really give us that, intuition training that you just can't get from books you know like potty training I could read a book about potty training I could read a video I could read this but if I talk to like my aunt for example who's been a nanny for her as a career she would give me a strategy that would be so tailored to my child because she can look at the child and know boom I've seen this before this is what you need to do mm -hmm. so the book might have some of that but it just doesn't give the full picture you know or someone like yourself who you know, has an, a child who's older than mine, you can give me tips and advice that I think sometimes is more useful, is more um, informative than something that I'll read in a book. We just, we just go to the book so much and we ignore what people, human beings have to say, the ones that we interact with. I agree with that to the extent that the, if the advice given is delivered in a, an appropriate way, like a non-judgmental or I don't know, like I, I think sometimes when you seek advice from others, then it comes back as gospel and that, that can be. Yeah, that's too. true. Right. Right. And it's, but if you look at it, it's the same way that the books are yeah. proposing, like they're proposing so this as, this is the right way to go. You know, it's, I think, yeah, sometimes like the, um, when, you know, people are sharing their advice, the, I, I agree with you. I think the approach really matters. Yeah. You know, don't talk to me in a way that's going to cause me to shut down. Like that's not yeah. helpful, but yeah, we have to also keep in mind, like I said, like the books, they have their position as well. And I imagine if those authors were, you know, in our faces, they would come on quite strong. 
Right. What is something unique about your specific parenting journey? Hmm. That's such a good question. I mean, I guess the most unique thing about my parenting journey is that it was unplanned. Even though I wanted children, I didn't know when I'd become a mom and it really came as a surprise. Like we weren't even married surprise. So it was like, whoa, okay. I have just been like pushed into this thing. Like I don't have a choice. I have a choice, but I chose, you know, to keep the baby. So um, okay, here we go. This I'm is happening. going to wing this. This is happening. Let's figure it out. And um, it's interesting because I didn't have a lot of time. I had a lot of decisions to make in a short amount of time. And, um, you know, I think I, I didn't have a lot of time to like think about my parenting journey or plan it out and give it some thought as I was planning to conceive, you know, that um, some of us get the opportunity to do. Like I may get that opportunity again, but yeah, that's been the most, I would say, like, interesting, unique part of my journey. Yeah, I bet that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> yeah, it was, like, really, it was really shocking. I mean, I was, like, over 30 at that point, so I was, like, yeah, like, since I want kids, I might as well just, like, do this whole thing. Yeah. And, like, my boyfriend and I, my husband and I at the time, boyfriend, we were, we'd already talked about getting married anyway, so it was, like, all right, I guess we just have to do this sooner. Yeah. Um, and so it was really, it was definitely bumpy, though. It was not it was not smooth sailing and I didn't really enjoy being pregnant at all. Um, I didn't enjoy the journey really for a long time because I, it was like unplanned and um, I was, I don't know if I was like beating myself up. I, I probably was wondering like, why did I, how did I get here? Like what? This is not the vision I had for my life. This is not the vision, you know? And I, I think that happens to a lot of women, whether it's, you know, you don't plan your pregnancy or your pregnancy is planned, but then, things happen with the baby or you feel a way that you didn't imagine you would feel and you're like whoa I didn't know becoming a new mom would feel this way this is not according to the vision I had in my mind and I think part of the parenting journey is learning that you have a vision but you have to like let go of that vision and let that vision become what it's supposed to become um, because you can't really control it. Yeah, kind of like having a labor and delivery plan, which is kind of bogus. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's like, um, you know, that's not going to happen at all how you thought, right? Like, that's totally happened to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on the pregnancy thing. I did not enjoy either of my pregnancies. It was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the emotional part for me was like really difficult, you know, and, and then the year afterwards. Oh. It was also like, whoa, what is this, right? But yeah. um, I don't know, parenting I have learned is, a, um, or I'm learning, is a process of letting go. Mm. So letting go of ideas that you have, letting go of the baby being a baby and transitioning to being a toddler, letting go of toddler becoming, you know, a preschooler and, and all of these, you know, just different transitions of letting go. And I think for moms, it starts after the child comes out of her womb. Yeah. What has surprised you about the way you parent? Is there anything that you do as a parent that you didn't expect yourself to do or maybe opinions or tactics that you use that uh, surprised you in, in how you thought you would actually approach being a mom? I think I'm more like my mom than I thought I would be. I'm more like my, my parents and in general, my culture, but specifically my mom. So my parents are from the Caribbean. They um, immigrated to Canada in the 60s. And so, uh, you know, they've been in Canada for, you know, their whole adult lives, but they still very much raise us with that Caribbean culture. And sometimes it's more, um, you know, strict and firm than North American culture. And I thought that I for sure thought that I'd be way more, you know, North American than I, than I am or Canadian than I am, you know, like I thought I'd be, you know, just having some of the parenting approaches that are common for our culture, but I'm more of a disciplinarian than I thought. Like I'm, I'm not hardcore, but like, I'm pretty just more strict, you know, and more like firm. And, um, especially now that my son is two, I, I, I hear myself talking how my parents talk like, <laughs> Oh, this is, this is the age that they get out of hand. You know, this is the age where you have to like, uh, instill these things in it. I'm talking like that. And I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> I did not think I'd be like this. 
Oh, that is so, so it's funny. like, I got to check myself sometimes, you know, like also like my mom is very, um, you know, everything has to be clean. Like she, you know, germs is like, bah, like, you know, she hates germs and everything's like clean and wash your hands and, you know, don't cut, put that on the floor. And I have had to check myself cause I've been, I've been being like that. And I had to, there's moments where I say, okay, that dot ball is super dirty. It was on the co- floor in the car. He's sucking on it, whatever, let it go he needs that exposure. Like it's okay. If, yeah. and, th- and this is where the travel comes in. Like I think about the kids that I've seen in other countries and I'm like, they're just playing and exploring and discovering. He doesn't have the play art that they have. So, you know, the little things that he finds in the car that he starts chewing on or whatever, it's, it's okay. If he picks up grass and he's like messing with the mud, like it's cool. It's fine. So yeah. I, I had to tell myself that stuff. And how do your parents react to your parenting style kind of mirroring how they parented you? Well, you know, the unfortunate thing about my parents not living near me is that they don't really see how I parent. I think I parent differently when my parents are around. How so? I think, I think that I don't parent. I think I get into child mode, quite honestly, and I kind of, like, let them um, do more of the wrangling of my of my son which and they and they don't even like treat him the way that they raise us as kids like you know grandparents are way more oh come here everything's okay yeah. like oh you know so they're so much more soft so I just kind of like let them direct me honestly so sometimes like they might say oh Eric's really tired he needs to you know it's time for him to to go to bed okay <laughs> Eric, it's time for you to bed. <laughs> or they're like, okay, he needs to eat. Like, when's the last time he ate? And so I would do, I would just like kind of follow their lead. It's kind of crazy, but that's the mode I get into when my parents are around. There is something about that, right? Like when your parents are around that you do revert back to like a 16-year-old version of yourself. And I yes, don't know what it definitely. is. I don't know what it is, but I kind of love it because then I know my kids will be that way. And it's right. Man, right. My parents are just a hop, skip and a jump away. So we're there a lot. But when it oh, when that awesome. really, when it really comes through is like the holidays. Right. And we go over yes. there for a whole day and yes. I just curl up on the couch and my kids are just right. running around and I am just like back to yes. my junior high, high school. So yes. it's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> It's so weird. That's me every time. Cause every time I go home, it's a, it's a trip. It's a visit, you know? So yeah. I'm like, all right. I, my mom even has some of like my old clothes from high school, like, you know, my, my house clothes. So I throw on my old sweats and just like, I do exactly what you just described. Yeah. It's kind of nice to always know that that feeling of home doesn't go away because I'm looking forward for my, to my kids doing that someday with their kids. Right. With That's their kind of- kids. Exactly. It is pretty cool. Yeah. I love that question. What is something that's really challenging about parenting right now? Not having the community, not having the the village physically close by. So I really, I do feel like I have a ton of supportive people, but I just constantly find myself thinking about my request inconveniencing them. Oh. So it just would be nice, like if someone honestly like lived across the street, like literally, you know, um, I just wish I had more people closer that I can call upon and yeah, like help me out, feed us, like swap house chores. I'll clean your house if you cook for me. You know, I want, I want to be able to do that with some folks nearby and it just seems too difficult. That's interesting. Do you think that you'll make any strides to kind of change that? Or do you feel so much, so much of it is that physical proximity. So you're limited. I think that I'm doing a better job of asking for help. So I, I don't see it as an impossible task or impossible behavior change. Um, it will come with me asking for more help and, and really brainstorming like, okay, maybe this person can't do that, but maybe they could do this. And maybe if I ask for more help, people will see that there really is a need there because I think that our culture has made us like just automatically assume that people are good. and mm-hmm. I find myself assuming that about my friends and I'm certain they assume that about me too. And if I never let them know that I'm not good, they won't ever know that. So I'm going to start asking for more help and being more honest and, and also offering help. I've gotten better about asking for help as well because I realized that 
if somebody asked me for help, I would be the first to say, absolutely. Yes. Like, let me figure right. out how to help you. And it's never an inconvenience. And, never. If, and if it was because of a scheduling, I would simply say I'm not available and, you know, and help them try to figure out another solution. Right. Exactly. I, I have a friend who is in a similar situation where she moved um, from Chicago and she has no one, no one, her and her husband and her two mm -hmm. little ones. And there have been many times that she has texted me, called me, knocked on my door because things come up and her husband travels. Um, so I've taken yeah. her to the emergency room once and I've watched wow. her multiple times and I am 100% happy to do it because I cannot imagine being in her position. Right. It's, right, just, exactly. it's really, really tough to be in a community where you don't have some built in family, friends that you've trusted for years. And so yeah. I am more than happy for her to lean on me and she has. And so I try to think about that whenever and if ever I need help. And I, I would say this year I've gotten a lot better of asking for help, even in situations mm. that I feel may be inconvenient for the other person. And it never is. Right. Um, it but, never is. It yeah. Never is. So I just kind of get over it and ask, and then it's always fine. And now that my kids are a little bit older, they have so much mm. fun doing whatever it is that they go off and do while, you know, right. without me. Exactly. So, exactly. Exactly. It's good for them as well. It is. And, and maybe that makes the decision a little bit easier when you, and they're not so little anymore, a little bit more self-sufficient, but I always hate asking right. them, exactly. why my kids ask, you know, that's always a hard one. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. But that's cool that you are experiencing the same thing over, you know, in the Midwest and really straight up like, you know, being that for other moms. I think that's really awesome. I'm trying, but then I, I still feel like use me more. Like I still feel like I, I don't, I have capacity to help. And so it's yeah, interesting this conversation yeah. because I, yeah. I, I agree. It's so, it's so needed. And I think we all feel that we could help more. We're just, we just don't right. know how to get this in motion and how to actually make right. it. Right. Exactly. And make it stick and, and yeah. make it really, you know, change the culture. Yeah. Cause that's, that's as, you know, drastic as it needs to be. The culture of this needs to change. Maybe it's just baby steps with, you know, you see one parent doing it and that leads to two and that leads to three. Yeah. And, you know, I think so. Change is imperceptible. You know, it takes yeah. a while for us to really notice, oh, yeah, that's different now. So it may not change like in our generation of parenting, but I think definitely our kids and their kids, I am hopeful that things will be better for them. Yeah, I agree 100%. Well, Erica, this was an amazing chat. Thank you so much for stopping by. But before you go, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you online because you guys, she is a must follow. So tell everyone. Oh, where you you're so awesome. I will. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Like I really enjoyed this conversation. It was so rich and I'm just so glad that, you know, we connected on social media. There really are awesome people out there um, like yourself. People can find me on Instagram, that is like the place I'm the most active. My personal handle is just E St. Louis, E S T L O U I S. My last name is pronounced St. Louis. And what else? Also, my podcast, the name of my podcast is The M Word with Erica. And you can find that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you like to get your favorite podcast. And as I mentioned earlier in the show, it's about the motherhood journey, sharing our truths about our, our joys and our struggles and just, you know, having, creating a space for the sisterhood of moms. Love it. I will make sure I link to all of the social profiles and your podcast. So go check out the show notes if you're listening and go follow Erica. Thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you to Erica for joining me today and thanks for listening. If you want to follow Erica on Instagram, which I highly recommend you do, find her at her handle e Saint Louis, spelled like St. Louis, and I'll link you over in the show notes if you want an easy way to get there. I will also link her podcast, The M Word with Erica, so go check that out. And if you find yourself having a hard time making a connection with new moms or dads in your area, then check out this blog post I wrote about how I went on a blind date with a new mom in my town. For real, my mother-in-law introduced us and I invited her to dinner one night just to get to know her and we've been friends ever since. So if you're having a hard time making those connections and finding that tribe, then check out this post. I'll be linking it in the show notes as well. 
And have you left a rating or review yet? It's a small thing that makes a big difference in the podcast world. So take a minute to subscribe and rate this show.